So my name is Jennifer Archer, and I'm the Director of Academic Development at NSCC, and I'm an outgoing board member of CAPLA. And I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our next speaker today. Um, but before I do so, I just want to take a moment to thank our gold level sponsor, the province of Ontario, for the support of the conference. The support of the sponsors is critical to the success of the yearly conference here at CAPLA. Um, so it's my honor this afternoon to introduce you to our luncheon keynote speaker, Jeff Griffiths. Jeff is the CEO of Griffiths Shepherd Consulting Group Incorporated in Calgary, Alberta. Jeff is a certified management consultant and a fellow of the Certified Management Consultant of Al Consultants of Alberta, where he serves as the registrar. He is a leading advocate for the integrated national skills, competency, qualifications frameworks and encourages organizations to look beyond job titles and formal credentials for evidence-based competency as the basis for hiring and advancement. I think you will find that this presentation dovetails nicely with the presentation that Phil is giving on assessment. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Griffiths. I've got, I think I'm on. Okay, so thanks. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our focus is on competency uh, and, uh, and competency-based learning, competency-based hiring, competency-based assessment, um, which up until a few years ago was a pretty lonely place to be. Uh, and it's, it's nice that uh, we seem to be at a watershed moment in, uh, in this world. Um, I think I'm preaching to the converted here, probably, right? Um, but who all here is a, uh, a career development counselor? Just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many folks are working uh, at one level or another of government? Who, how many folks are in the post-secondaries? Okay, so uh, a big bunch of you. Professional associations, credentialing bodies? Okay. And I see a few faces that I know from uh, other, other talks and from, my, uh, from Calgary, so good to be here. So I'll start with uh, kind of the, the basis of, of my business, which is that nobody is just their job description and the credentials that we have, and certainly the way we use credentials in Canada, are often meaningless in the, uh, in the economy. And before anybody throws anything at me, I want to explain where I'm coming from, okay? So when I started in this business uh, about 20 years ago, one of my first jobs was doing an uh, assessment on skills in the maintenance departments for a multinational food processing company. And we did six different plants across Canada looking at maintenance uh, trades. So these are Red Seal, Millwrights, electricians. Uh, some of the plants had power engineers. And so the, the logical approach would have been to look at the existing occupational standards and occupational analyses and figure out what people should be able to do, right? That makes sense. So that's what we did. And unfortunately, what we found was a lot of what these people were doing wasn't actually part of their official occupational description. Okay, maybe it's an anomaly. Maybe that's specific to this company because this was one particular company. We did another job uh, not long after that, 30 operating locations, different industry, multiple companies. And what we found was that up to 50% of what people did on the job wasn't actually part of their trade. In fact, it was often the most critical things that they did weren't reflected in the credential that they had. So the formal credential didn't guarantee competency, which is a bit of a problem. And it, for me, it was a head scratcher. And I was a young consultant then. Um, 
you know, if the credential doesn't help you find the people with the skills that you need and the most critical skills, what do you do? How do you, how do you staff positions? And on the other side of that is what is the, uh, you know, like what, how many people, potentially really good candidates, are eliminated from consideration because they don't have the credential that doesn't mean anything in the first place. And I know there's a lot of you in this room today who deal with that paradox still every single day. When times were simpler and jobs were siloed and the differences between jobs were clearer, the borders between jobs and the credentials that, that applied to jobs actually made a lot of sense. And you could use them as a proxy. But the times have changed. And what we found over the years is, and I'm sure you guys have seen it, is that the borders that are, are between or the barriers between what used to be discrete occupations are getting fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. And at the same time, the level of specialization within an occupation is becoming more apparent. So calling someone an engineer is becoming less and less meaningless because you have to figure out what flavor of engineer they are. Uh, and even within a subspecialty within engineering, mechanical or whatever, you still need to get into the subspecializations to find out what the specific technical skills are. So the world of work is changing and we need more agile organizations. Why did that change back? <laughs> it's a cute picture, but it isn't the right one. Uh, so the world of work is changing. We need more agile organizations. We need agile people on agile teams to react to a tumultuous future and to change. And this isn't just in, uh, high t in the high-tech world. We hear all about this in, in high-tech industries. It's in all jobs because the robots are coming. They are going to get you. AI and machine learning, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this over the, over the course of the uh, last couple of days, Th it's changing the way we work. It's going to change every job, my job, your job, everybody else's job. And the credentials that you have now won't necessarily be particularly relevant even a very short time in the future. If you're like me and you have a business degree, that uh, I got back in the 80s before desktop computers were a thing. You know, it, if you use that as the basis for des deciding if I'm actually capable of doing anything, and if you've seen me fumbling with the computer today, you know that I'm still useless. But those credentials decay over time, and the, and the half-life of, the, of credentials is declining and it's declining significantly. And there's a lot of people that are going to be displaced by the robots who don't even have outdated credentials to fall back on. And this is a problem. We're seeing this problem in Alberta right now because of the upheaval in the oil patch. And uh, a lot of people trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Because a lot of those jobs are not coming back. They're about to close down all of our coal mines in Alberta. Those jobs aren't going to come back. It's not like they're going to move to West Virginia to work in the coal mines. Okay. So the traditional ways that we look at jobs, at work, and at credentialing aren't appropriate for a changing future. And Competencies, and I know, uh, Phil, you were, you were talking about specifically around competency-based assessment, competency standards. The competencies are the witch's brew for the future. This is the secret sauce that's going to drive change. And we've been talking about it. I know you guys have been talking about it. P 
people in our industry have been talking about this for years. But there's evidence, I think, now that we're at a tipping point on this. We're very, very close to a brave new world. And uh, I want to give a couple of examples, well, more than a couple of examples, of really cool stuff that's going on. You may or may not be aware of it. There's uh, a groundswell of new activity around this uh, internationally that I think is going to lead to a complete sea change. So there's hope. I'll start with one example. Uh, Compose used to be an independent company. They're a, uh, a database as a service company based in the cloud. In 2015, they were bought by IBM. Compose was a proponent of uh, what they called blind hiring. They n didn't use resumes. They actually had people code. They had code fights and codeathons, and picked people with the proper skills and never looked at a resume. One of the factors that caused IBM to buy these guys in the, uh, back in 2015 was the quality of the personnel and the process that they used to get it. So IBM's paid attention and they've bought these guys. Now I don't know whether, because IBM's a bit of an oil tanker and it's kind of hard to turn them around, I don't know whether this approach will permeate through IBM, but this particular operating division in IBM still doesn't use resumes to determine who they're going to hire, which is kind of exciting. At the same time that this is going on, uh, the Gallup organization in the United States did a study last year and found that the number of Americans who think that a college degree is a necessary prerequisite to workplace success, that's declined 13% since they did the study in 2009. And that doesn't mean that people don't think uh, that skills are, aren't important, because they do. They just don't think the piece of paper attached to those skills is as valuable in the workplace as it used to be. And for instance, uh, this study actually happened before the last presidential election. <laughs> so no, that's, that the X factor is not part of, of, of that report. Okay. So that's a, a, a bit of a quandary because the skills are still necessary and everybody recognizes that, but the way traditionally to get those skills through traditional pathways isn't. Which brings us to these guys who are disrupting some of the space. So you have Udacity and their uh, nano degrees. Um, you, uh, Coursera, I think they call it a micro masters. Okay. Uh, Lynda.com is now providing uh, modularized content to all of the post-secondaries in Ontario, as I understand it, if they finally signed that contract. They have? OK. Uh, so there's this faster, cheaper micro learning and I know uh, if uh, Don's here in the room, so he's probably been pounding the drum on badging. A um, <laughs> little bit? OK. Uh, so and the, the badges that can be attached to this micro learning, which brings me to my next slide. This technology is in version 2.0 now. And 2.0 actually has the embedded evidence embedded in the badges. So the uh, employers, learning providers, can now see the evidence which was the basis for the badges being, uh, being awarded in the first place. So small learning micro-credentials badged appropriately and visible uh, in a way that it never was before. Which brings us to one of the other horsemen of the apocalypse. George Mason University is now accepting IBM company training 
directly into their master's programs. George Mason down in Virginia. See, it used to be the arrow went the other way. You went to the school to get the job. Now you get the job to get to school. Western Governors University in the U.S. is doing a lot of stuff around competency-based uh, assessment and pulling people out of industry and fast-tracking them through specific learning and then right back into industry again. So the world is changing slowly, but it's changing. Don probably mentioned these guys as well. Uh, the stuff that uh, Don's group in Cancred uh, are doing around open badging and badge pathways and the, uh, uh, the, the backpack stuff. Badger is Concentric Sky out of Oregon. You may or may not be familiar with. But this is a way of tying all of these various badges together. And they have an open pathways framework now, which is open and available to the whole world as a standard to use that allows you to tie these pathways, these micro-credentials together in a, in a meaningful way that matters to the uh, learning providers and to employers. So the evidence that never used to be there around this is we're starting to have the technology to make the evidence easy to produce and easy to track. And if you add a blockchain in there so that there's a trusted linkage between the credential, the learning provider, and the person holding the credential, now you have uh, the element of trust involved in this as well now. And we've completely shifted the paradigm into a trust-based electronic mechanism for demonstrating that you can actually do something. Lumina Foundation in the U.S., with their credential engine, which you may or may not be familiar with, but the credential engine is designed to make a level playing field using common uh, architecture and common definitions for competency that allows us to compare all credentials on a level playing field based on the underlying competency that's in them. Early days yet, they've got a prototype that's working now with a few credentials in it, but eventually, we may have a mechanism through Credential Engine that will allow us to use multiple credentials for the same competency. That's at the credential side. Innovate and Educate in the U.S. had a no resume hiring fair. Resumes not allowed. They did testing. They did uh, demonstrated skills in a four-hour workshop in a job fair down in Albuquerque. 300 at-risk people, young people, were hired as a result of that four-hour experiment. They're working very diligently to convince employers to recognize skill that's not credentialed. Here's one of my favorite stories. Anybody familiar with Next Jump? Probably not. These guys are a e-commerce company, uh, and they were they hire engineers. <laughs> they used to hire engineers. <laughs> so, Next Jump. They, uh, they started hiring engineers around 2006, and I don't need the slides to tell the story. They, uh, they did what everybody else does, and they're fighting against the Googles and the Facebooks and the Microsofts and the IBMs to uh, attract talent. And they don't have the pockets deep enough to outfight those other guys for the talent. But they went through the, they played the game anyway, the way everybody else did back in 06. And what they found was, to quote one of their executives, is they hired a lot of really smart jerks. <laughs> Individuals, people who were really good at, uh, at coding and, uh, and the skills, the engineering skills that they needed, but that were absolutely incapable of working with other people. 
And if any of you have worked with engineers, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time in aerospace. So, um, so you know, people with raw smarts and all the arrogance that goes along with it. And so, and what they found was some of the people that they had recruited that they'd spent the most money trying to attract into their organization on the basis of these really, really top-notch credentials, wound up jumping ship for one of the competitors within a year or two anyway for more money. And so they lost the investment in, the, in, in that individual. And they probably weren't all that sorry because they were jerks to begin with. But the point is they had to change. So in 2008, they fired half their engineering staff. And they now do something they call Super Saturdays. And in Super Saturdays, what they do is they bring in all of the job candidates and the uh, staff from uh, Next Jump, has a, they have a little app on their smartphone. And the candidates go through a number of exercises and briefings and Q&A sessions and everything else. And the staff are observing them and marking red flags, green flags, commenting. And all of that data is going to the war room. And so at the end of the day, they know not only uh, what these people have, and they're all skilled people, they've all got the, the, the technical smarts, but they also know, do they ask questions? And more importantly, how do they react to the questions that other people ask? and they prevent themselves from hiring a bunch of arrogant pricks. <laughs> and their turnover is next to nothing now. Their productivity is through the roof because they've got people with the right fit and it's based on soft skills. And soft skills are hard, <laughs> as anybody who has to teach them knows. These guys are a really cool technology-enabled way of figuring out the way people work and the way they'll work together in an informal setting. Because then you find what people are like when the blinders are off, when the, uh, when the barriers are down. Penguin and Random House, the publishers, are no longer using uh, degrees as a criteria for entry-level positions with their organization as of sometime last year. Hmm? They still employ people? Yeah, they do. Yeah, books still exist, oddly enough. Um, in my business, in the consulting business, EY, Ernst & Young, has stopped putting uh, degree and resume information in front of the hiring managers. And as they say, how do they say, we view this as a misleading indicator and have decided to conceal credentials from hiring managers. So if you get to the hiring manager because someone's already decided you have the technical skills and you're not allowed to talk about where you went to school, what you, uh, w which degree you have or anything like that in the, in the hiring process once you get to the hiring manager. They're hiring people based on their ability to work with the team. These are soft skill competencies that are being used in a hiring uh, environment. Deloitte no longer considers where you went to school they, they still consider degrees, but they no longer consider or rank where you got the degree in terms of where you fit in the pecking order in the hiring food chain. So whether you got your degree from Harvard or you got your degree from, I don't know, University of Calgary, where I'm from, when you get to the this hiring decision, they have the same weight. They're no longer using that. It's not where you're from. And finally, Godzilla, uh, they've said, and I'll quote this as well, we view traditional degrees as, a, as worthless as a criteria for hiring. And now apparently are making their hiring decisions based on portfolios and competencies. I've never been hired by Google, so I don't know if that's hogwash, but that's what they say. If I had come in here uh, even a few years ago with some of these examples, you'd have laughed me out of the room. 
but the world is changing. We're at a watershed moment for competency. You may have noticed that I, I did mention CanCred. Gave, actually, I gave you a couple, of, a couple of plugs. I mentioned the stuff that Phil's group's doing. But there's not a lot of CanCon in my presentation. And uh, hopefully the CRTC isn't around. And that's a problem. There's pockets of this going on in Canada, but we're small and isolated. And we keep having these interprovincial bun fights over whose fault it is, which is stupid. And if there's government people in the room, I'm sorry, but it's stupid. I've read the Constitution. I did. I couldn't find anywhere in there where it outlawed common sense. <laughs> and if anybody from government can explain to me why I can be walking down one side of 50th Avenue in Lloydminster, which is the Alberta side of Lloydminster, and be competent and qualified, and step across to the coffee shop on the other side of 50th Avenue, which is now in Saskatchewan, and now I'm an incompetent git. If you can explain to me why that makes sense, I'll shut up. <laughs> but they can't, so I don't. The problem we have is a lot of small ma uh, employers are disadvantaged. Google's got lots of resources to do this, but the small guys, they don't. And what we've been advocating for, uh, you may or may not be aware of this thing, um, but we, uh, myself and, and Janet Lane from the Canada West Foundation, uh, put this paper out at the beginning of the year advocating and creating a, uh, 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 basically a business case around a pan-Canadian skills competency qualifications framework, which we think is the piece that's missing because it gives you something to hang the badges off of in a coherent way and it gives people, uh, whether they're in the post-secondaries, uh, in the uh, learning providers, individuals, employers, something to relate all of this mess of competency information together on. If you're interested in a copy of this, let me know and I'll, I'll send you a copy uh, or you can download it from uh, Canada West's uh, website. It's available online. Um, we've had a lot of really good feedback uh, from across the country and around the world actually on this. Uh, and we see I, we hit, either we, we, we released it <clears throat> right when the time was right or it hit a nerve. Either way, I don't care. They're paying attention. Um, and uh, we, uh, we just actually, uh, two days ago, signed a contract to update the career handbook, or at least create the methodology for updating the career handbook. How many people here use the career handbook? How many people here even know what it is? Okay. Right, well the career handbook is uh, one of those mother documents, and it was created and published in 03 based on the 2001 NOC codes and hasn't been updated since. And as you know, nothing has changed occupationally in Canada <laughs> since 2001. So it was badly in need of an update. We've convinced them to let us show them a way to do this, not only update it, but keep it up to date in, rel in a relational way using real-time information from the economy so that it not only be gets up to date, but it stays up to date and actually becomes a usable tool for career development and, uh, and job matching and transitions within the economy. L this is the uh, piece that links to the Canada Job Bank. So we're looking at that. The other thing, I'm going to finish with a Canadian story. So we'll get some CanCon. Uh, Jobical, jobical.com. Just after we published the paper, in, uh, uh, at the beginning of the year, we ran into these folks. Jobical is a uh, startup in Calgary, uh, they, and what they're doing is creating a software that matches uh, the uh, competencies that people have with the competencies that jobs require and employers require. So in effect, they've created the, uh, the software infrastructure to do what we described in the paper, which is really cool for us because it saves us doing it. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it was a good idea. We thought, great, who cares? They've got 12,000 users since the beginning of the year on that system. It's live and online now. They've got over 200 companies that are using it, primarily in the IT space, but they're expanding into other places. There's information on Jobical I left at, uh, on the desks at the back of the room. So there's really cool stuff going on. And I'm almost out of time. But I'm geeked. <laughs> I am really, really geeked about this stuff. Like I said, if I'd have come in here a few years ago and talked about this, you'd have laughed me out of the room. And now you're not. We are so close to a significant sea change in this. The technologies are lining up. The need in the marketplace is lining up. And employers and the post-secondaries, I'm doing work with one of the colleges in, uh, in Calgary right now to try and figure out how to create fully competency-based lifelong learning pathways using the school as the in entry and exit point throughout a career. If I'd have talked about that a few years ago, I'd have got thrown out of the school. Now they're not throwing me out. This is really cool stuff. So I am hugely excited for the future for competencies, for competency-based credentialing, and for competency-based hiring. And the, real, and the best part of it is, is that we're all, you people, are on the forefront of it. And you're going to be you know, a witness to history and part of this as we finally get this to happen in industry. And that's just really, really cool. So thanks, and hopefully I didn't upset your lunch. Just want to thank you, Jeff. That was a great thank presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your vision of the future of competency-based uh, assessment and the importance of competencies in the future of education and work.